Hello students, in this video we'll prove that a Hallmark function defined on the unit disk has a primitive. So here's our theorem. Given if f maps the unit disk into c is holomorphic, then it has a primitive. In other words, there's a function f such that f prime is equal to f. Okay, excellent. Our proof is going to rely heavily on Gorsaw's theorem. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, if we look at the unit disk over here, here's our unit disk. And any point in the unit disk, I can draw a line. So here's the real axis, here's the imaginary axis. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a trajectory. This trajectory is going to go from the origin over here to the real part of z. And it's going to go up to z like this. That's going to be my trajectory gamma of z. Okay? So it's going to go from 0 to the real part of z up to z. Okay? And we can define f capital of z to be the integral over this curve gamma z, this polygonal curve gamma z, f of zeta d zeta, okay? And this gives me an unambiguous definition because f is holomorphic in this region over here, okay? So if I reparameterize this curve some other way, I get the same exact answer. So this unambiguously defines f of z, okay? So now what we want to do is we need to consider, we claim, I claim that f prime of z is equal to f of z. That should make intuitive sense, right? I'm doing the derivative of an integral, I should just get the function back inside. I have to show, though, that based on what this curve is, I get, in fact, f of z, okay? So let's do it. So what we're going to do is the following. Let's consider the ratio f of z plus h minus f of z over h, like that. That's the difference quotient, okay? And so this is going to be 1 over h and then the difference of f of z plus h minus f of z, okay? And then this thing over here is going to be equal to what? And this is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to 1 over h, the integral over gamma z plus h, f of z, f of, uh, yep, f of zeta d zeta. So let's put a zeta over there, f of zeta d zeta. minus the integral over gamma z, f of zeta d zeta, like so, okay? Now, what's the essential idea behind this? The essential idea is that whenever you have a negative sign in front of an integral, like I do over here, I can turn that into a plus if I take the curve and I give it the opposite orientation. So this is the opposite orientation curve, opposite orientation. Okay, so I make that adjustment. So I put a plus between those two things and I look at the curve in opposite orientation. So here's our configuration. So if I look at gamma of z plus h, what does gamma of z plus h look like? Gamma of z plus h looks like this. I go from zero up to the real part of z plus h. And I go up to what? Then I go up to z plus h. This curve over here that I just drew is the curve that corresponds to gamma of z plus h. Okay, which by definition. Now I'm going to draw the curve that corresponds to gamma of z in the opposite orientation. So here's the real part of z, that's the real part of z, and then up over here is just z itself. But now I oppositely orient it, so I'm going to opposite orient this thing over here, and then opposite orient this thing over here. And since I've opposite oriented this portion over here, this portion over here entirely cancels out, right, because there are opposite orientations. So this part over here is going to cancel from our integral. Okay, that cancels out because it's opposite orientation. Okay, now we want to really leverage Gorsaw's theorem over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find as many closed curves as I can, right? So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to add in a closed curve. I'm going to close off that portion over here from my curve. And to close it off, I need to add it in. And I also need to subtract it off, right? So I've added it in, and now I'm going to subtract it off. So that gives me nothing. So I've added nothing over here. We've added nothing. Add 
zero. But now look what happens. I have, I'm going this way, and then this way, and then this way, and then this way. That's a, that's a rectangle over there, an oriented rectangle. And so by Gorsaw's theorem, so Gorsaw, Gorsaw's theorem tells me that the integral over this rectangle, f of zeta d zeta, is equal to zero. Perfect. And so now all that's left is what? All that's left is this orange piece that's going this direction and that little piece over there. So all that's left now is that little tiny piece. So this is equal to one over h, then the integral over, um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna draw it like this, I'm gonna make a path like this. It's gonna start over here, over here at the at z. It goes from z to where? It goes from z up to the real part of z plus h plus the imaginary part. I'm gonna call that point over there, let's call that point over there just alpha for simplicity, right? z to alpha up to z plus h of f of zeta d zeta. And so this is notation for the polygonal line, polygonal line segment from z to alpha to z plus h, okay? And now I want to simplify that even further over here, right? I'm going to simplify that either, even further by adding in one more piece over here. And so if I go from this point over here, z, over here to this point, alpha, up to the point z plus h, then what will we get? Then we're going to get the following. I go like this, and this, and this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And I'm going to add and subtract in one final thing. I'm going to add and subtract in this line over here from z to z plus h. So if I do it like this, that would form a triangle t, and then I have to, I have to counterbalance that. So I have to actually add in the opposite orientation too. That's going from z to z plus h. And now by Gorsaw, by Gorsaw, the integral over t of f of zeta d zeta is equal to zero. So all that we really have over here is this simplifies even further. This expression is going to simplify. This expression over here simplifies to one over h, the integral from just z to z plus h of f of zeta d zeta. Okay, beautiful. Now, if this was just ordinary calculus, we would know that as h goes to zero, this goes to f of z. If that was just ordinary calculus. A little bit more to do over here, right? And so let's do this a little more pedantically. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, say this is equal to 1 over h, 1 over h, the integral from z to z plus h of what? Of f of zeta and then plus minus f of z d zeta. Okay? I just add and subtract it, nothing. And so now I get two integrals to do. So I have the integral of f of z d zeta. That's a constant, right? So this is equal to what? This is equal to um, what we're going to have over here. We're going to have f of z over h, the integral from z to z plus h of d zeta. And then we're going to have plus 1 over h, the integral from z to z plus h of what? Of f of z minus f of zeta, d zeta. Okay. Now this thing over here just integrates to what? This thing over here just integrates to f of z. So this expression is f of z. And then what's happening over here? Then plus these terms over here, which we have to show are going to zero. One over h, the integral from z to z plus h, f of zeta minus f of z. Okay. d zeta. So now let me estimate this term over here. So I'm going to take the absolute value of this term over here. I'm going to use the m times l inequality, right? will happen. So this is f of z. So this term in the, in the parentheses over here. So this is this expression is f of z, which we want, plus this term. If I can show that term goes to zero, let's call it the term i. What's i less than? i is less than or equal to 1 over h. Then the length of this thing over here, the length of this thing is comparable to h, right? If I go from z to z plus h, I should have a constant times h, a constant times h. And then times the what? Times the max or the super bowl, the max actually exists over here, over all points zeta minus z, over all zeta, the max of f of zeta minus f of z, like this, where zeta lies on this line segment over here, where zeta 
is on the line segment from z to z plus h. Okay. Now, of course, the h's cancel out over here. Actually, a constant times this maximum. What's happening to this maximum over here? Well, what do I know? If h is sufficiently small, then that says that zeta is really close to what? If h is small, then zeta is close to z. And then by continuity, that has to be small. So in other words, as h goes to zero, since f is continuous, f continuous at z, because it's holomorphic there, means that the maximum over the set z to z plus h, that curve, of maximum of f of zeta minus f of z by continuity tends to zero as h goes to zero. Okay, that's just the definition of continuity. So i tends to zero as h goes to zero. i tends to zero as h goes to zero. And that proves that this difference quotient over here, that proves that our difference quotients, the limits as h goes to zero of f of z plus h minus f of z all over h is equal to little f of z, or f prime of z is equal to f of z, and we have our proof. Excellent. So that was a little bit of legwork, but what's the what's one comment I want to make before we end the video? One comment I want to make is that I said let f be holomorphic on the unit disk. Fine, easy to understand. What was the only thing I needed over here? The only thing I needed to do was that the region had to be what? Polygonally connected. So in other words, I would have to go from zero up to z by a uh, polygonal path. So this argument, nothing, nothing about this argument is sacred. All I'm using over here is the fact that this, the function f is continuous, and then I'm using closed curve arguments to make, to make what? To make rectangles and to make triangles. So in other words, I need to make rectangles and triangles, and that's possible if I can connect any two points in the region via a polygonal path, right? So in other words, all I need from this argument, I don't need the geometry of the disk. I could have more complex, I could have, I could have a rectangle, I can still do the same argument on a rectangle. I could have a circle with a, a keyhole punched out of it. That would also work, because those are also polygonally connected. So any region you draw that's polygonally collected and whose boundary is smooth enough, right, just smooth enough, then I can run the same scheme over here. So in other words, a primitive will exist not only in the unit disk, if the function is holomorphic, but will exist in more general geometries as long as I'm able to connect two points via a polygonal path. And so you'll see those more technical arguments in more advanced books on complex analysis, but it's important to understand why the argument's going to work. The argument works just by, by virtue of continuity and by virtue of Gorsaw's theorem, as long as I can make what? As long as I can make rectangles and triangles. If I can make rectangles and triangles, I can do I can make rectangles and triangles if I can connect things with a polygonal path, right? So I could draw polygonal paths, I'm able to draw a whole bunch of little small rectangles, a whole bunch of little small triangles, and run the same exact argument. It becomes more geometrically technical in most cases, but nonetheless, it suffices for us to use that argument in further calculations. Thank you very much.